So more and more people are joining. Welcome everyone. We're going to start in just a few minutes. This is a sound check. I'm checking to make sure that you can hear me. So there's more information on the audio or on the slide if you need help setting up your audio. So as we're waiting for a few more people to join, please tell us in the chat where you're joining us from today. So I'm joining you all from Seattle and I'd love to hear where others are located. Chicago, welcome. San Diego, Queens, Sacramento, Pennsylvania. I noticed we had a lot of folks from Pennsylvania register for the webinar. So welcome, Pennsylvania, Charlevoix, Michigan, Baltimore, Plainsboro, Connecticut, welcome. Huntsville, Texas, welcome. So I see the attendee number going up and up still, so let's wait just a minute um, before we begin give folks a chance to get settled in. Okay, I think we can get started with the introductory slides um, as people are joining. Um, so Miles, next slide, please. So hello and welcome to today's webinar, Transgender and Gender Non-Binary Sexual and Reproductive Health. My name is Emily Hamstra and I'm the Outreach and Access Coordinator for the Network of the National Library of Medicine, Region 5, and I'm one of the hosts for today's webinar. Next slide, please. Since some of you might be first time attendees to a Network of the National Library of Medicine class, I wanna briefly introduce our organization. So the National Library of Medicine is one of the National Institutes of Health, or the NIH, and it's the world's largest biomedical library. It maintains and makes available a vast print and digital collection, and it produces electronic resource information resources like Medline Plus and our favorite PubMed. Um, the Network of the National Library of Medicine, or NNLM, is an outreach and engagement arm of the NLM. The NNLM provides training like today's class, as well as we offer funding opportunities to organizations for outreach programs that focus on expanding access to health information. Today's webinar was organized by the NNLM Region 5 and the Public Health Collaborative. The Public Health Collaborative is an internal group within the NNLM coordinating activities for public health professionals. And there are many ways for you to get involved in the NNLM. And I encourage you to visit nnlm.gov um, to find your region and to connect with free resources and services that are available. Uh, next slide, please. Today's webinar is part of the Public Health Webinar Series. The NNLM's Public Health Webinar Series provides training opportunities for public health workers. The series is organized and hosted by NNLM's Public Health Collaborative. This webinar does provide MLACE and CHESS credit, and more information will be provided at the end of the webinar. The session is being recorded, and we will post this to our YouTube channel within the next few weeks. Uh, next slide, please. And I have a few tips and reminders before we begin the presentation. So everyone was muted as you entered the webinar, and I encourage you to share your questions and comments throughout the webinar using the chat box. Send chat messages to all participants. And um, Dana and I are gonna be collecting questions during the presentation, and those will be addressed at the end of the webinar. Live captioning is provided for this session. 
And again, this webinar provides CHESS, CPH, and MLA continuing education credit. For more information about those credits, um, stick around towards the end of the webinar and we'll provide you with more information. Um, next slide, please. And finally, all webinars provided by the Network of the National Library of Medicine follow a code of conduct. In short, as we all learn together today, all attendees, hosts, and presenters will use welcoming and inclusive language. We will be respectful of different viewpoints and experiences. We will gracefully accept constructive criticism. We're gonna show courtesy and respect towards other community members. We have a zero tolerance for hostile or harassing conduct in any form. And you can read more details about our code of conduct on our website, and I'm gonna share that in, a in the chat box in just a moment. Um, and now I'm gonna turn things over to my colleague, Dana Dickman, Assist Assistant Director of the NNLM Region 5 to introduce our speaker. Great. Thanks, Emily. Um, so, hi, I'm Dana Dickman. My pronouns are she, her, and I am so excited to introduce Miles for today's webinar. Miles Harris is a trans and non-binary identified family nurse practitioner in Sacramento, California, and his pronouns are he, him. He serves as the director of gender affirming care at the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing at the University of California, Davis. And he is also the lead provider for transgender health at One Community Health. Prior to moving to California, he worked in New York City at the Mount Sinai Center for Transgender Medicine and Surgery. When not at work, Miles enjoys cross stitching and long distance runs. Um, and like Emily mentioned, we'll have time at the end for Q&A, so make sure and put any questions in the chat and we will keep track of those. And I'm now happy to turn it over to Miles. Thank you so much, Dana. How's my audio? Good? Awesome. Okay, so I think all of these things have already been said. You are at Transgender and Gender Nonbinary Sexual and Reproductive Health. I'm Miles Harris, and I use he, him pronouns. Uh, my titles have been slightly wordsmithed since I sent that bio. I am the Director of Gender Affirming Care at UC Davis Health and a consulting uh, nurse practitioner for the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing. And I am the lead provider for transgender health at One Community Health, which is a federally qualified health center here in Sacramento, where I am speaking to you from. My uh, disclosure is I am on the Speaker Bureau for Gilead. Today, we will reassess our assumptions about sexual and reproductive health concerns for transgender and gender non-binary patients. We will learn some principles of taking a transgender inclusive sexual health history, and then we will identify needs of transgender and gender non-binary patients related to sexual and reproductive health topics, including fertility, contraception, and cervical cancer screenings. So before we get into that, we are going to do a little uh, concepts language starter pack. Uh, when people think about transgender and gender non-binary health, sometimes people think of this word cloud here. It can be overwhelming, lots of terms which might be unfamiliar. Some people might feel like this person here, overwhelmed, concerned, so let's uh, break things down first. We're going to start off with the term sex assigned at birth. You might have heard terms that feel similar, like real sex, true sex, birth sex, original sex, biologic or biological sex. I would like you to get out the red pen of your brain and cross them out and really remember the term sex assigned at birth. And here's why. We all pop out into the world somehow. We make it out. And someone, often a healthcare provider, looks at our little bodies and decides whether we are going to be assigned male or female. Sometimes that maybe happens with an ultrasound before we come out, but nonetheless, it is based on how our genitals look as infants. And for the vast majority of us, that is what, that is all that goes into how we have decided what uh, how it is decided for us what sex we are. There are certainly many other things that go into our understanding of what sex is, 
our internal reproductive organs, our chromosomes, our secondary sex characteristics, or hormone levels. But unless something's wrong, often those things are never assessed. We don't have imaging, we don't have karyotypes, we don't have our hormones checked, unless there's a particular reason to do so. It really is how our bodies look as infants, which determines what sex we are assigned at birth. So this term is really uh, the most accurate and descriptive. Uh, the vast majority of uh, us are assigned male or female at birth. So I'm going to use some acronyms for that. AFAB, assigned female at birth. AMAB, assigned male at birth. There are uh, infants, people who are born with intersex characteristics and I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail about intersex uh, at the moment, but certainly this citation that's in the lower right corner here is a great resource for you to learn more uh, about intersex people. Intersex is an umbrella term for differences in sex traits or reproductive anatomy. Many possible differences in all of those things that go into what makes up what we understand as sex. Um, you may also hear the term differences or disorders of sexual development, and these terms may be preferred by some people. Intersex slash DSD community is by no means a monolith, and there's definitely going to be some differences uh, in what people prefer. The next term we're going to look at is gender identity. I think this is a good moment to point out that the uh, two dimensions allowed to us from a PowerPoint does not capture human experience. So we're not like all on a clothesline from right to left. If I could give you a constellation or a galaxy, perhaps that would better capture, uh, you know, how capture gender identity and some of these other concepts, but we make do. So gender identity is an individual sense of being a woman, a man, both a woman and a man, neither a woman nor a man or something else completely. Gender identity can be female woman, can be male man, or can be something else. The umbrella for the something else we will call non-binary uh, for the purposes of today. You might hear many other terms which uh, can be sort of under the non-binary umbrella, uh, but non-binary given that it is neither woman man nor, I'm sorry, woman, female woman or male man, Sort of captures all of those. We're going to introduce a couple more terms here. Cisgender describes a person whose gender identity is what is expected of them based on their sex assigned at birth. So if you'll check out these dinosaurs over on the upper left of your screen, there's a dinosaur on assigned female at birth, and there's a dinosaur on female or woman for gender identity. So this person could be described as a cisgender woman because someone who is assigned female at birth uh, is expected to have a, culturally expected to have a gender identity of female or woman. This next set of dinosaurs, we've got a dinosaur on assigned male at birth on the upper right, and then a dinosaur on woman for gender identity. And so this could describe, this could be described as someone who's transgender, who is someone whose gender identity is different from what was expected of them culturally based on their sex assigned at birth. I'm going to use the acronym TGNB for transgender and gender non-binary throughout the presentation. You might see other variations of this in literature. I, there's often TGD for transgender and gender diverse. The next thing we're going to look at is gender expression. Gender expression includes all of the signifiers that are associated with masculinity or femininity within a given cultural context. I think the cultural context part is really important here. What is considered masculine or feminine is very specific to any given time and place. What it means to even wear pants today is very different from what it meant to wear pants 100 years ago or 200 years ago, even here in Sacramento, much less in a different geographic location. So keep that in mind. Gender expression can be described as feminine, as masculine, 
as neither, which could be androgynous. There are certainly gender expressions that are both masculine and feminine. And I would guess that most people feel like their gender expression is neither exclusively masculine nor feminine. And most people think they have some traits that are both. Finally, we're going to get to sexual or romantic attraction. If you think of the acronym LGBTQA+, all of those letters, except for the T, are related to sexual romantic attraction. On the left, we have attracted to men. On the right, we have attracted to women. And then a million other things in the middle. People could be attracted to people of multiple genders, to non-binary people, to people of no genders. I put an asterisk on the multiple to remind us that we're gonna not say both. Uh, both here sort of reinforces the idea of a gender binary. So saying multiple helps to embrace that there are more than two gender identities. These are all, this is uh, by no means a list of all sexual orientations or gender identities, but I think it's helpful to see all of these words in one place, lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, straight, asexual are all sexual orientations, cisgender, transgender, non-binary, those are all gender identities. Before I move on, I want to flip back to this slide and emphasize that these all, all of these four things operate independently. So just because you know where someone falls on one of these spectra doesn't mean you know anything about where that person falls on any of the others. Uh, so for an example, uh, just because someone has a masculine gender expression doesn't mean that you know that their gender identity is male or man. Just because uh, someone is a man who is attracted to men doesn't mean you can make any guesses about what that person's gender expression is going to be. Okay, let's move on to talking about elements of an inclusive sexual health history. We have a poll question for you, but we're going to just use it in the chat. So either in your heart, excuse me, in your heart or in the chat, feel free to pick a number. Uh, what is the best way to know with whom our patients are sexually active? One, assume patients have opposite sex partners unless they tell us otherwise. Two, ask your partner, ask your patient, your partners are men, right? Or your partners are women, right? Ask, do you have sex with men, women, or both? Or four, something else, none of those above. I'll give everyone a couple seconds to think that over. And we will circle back to this question after we talk about it. So who needs a transgender non-binary inclusive sexual health history? Everyone does. So why is this everyone and not just the patients who we know or think are trans or non-binary? So first, our trans and non-binary patients might not have disclosed to us uh, that they are trans or non-binary for a variety of reasons. They might not feel safe. They may be waiting till um, you as a healthcare provider demonstrate that uh, you have some competence here. And that sort of leads into the next one, taking a competent sexual health history uh, that is inclusive of trans and non-binary people is going to help uh, trans and non-binary patients, but also LGBTQ patients more broadly feel safer with you, feel like you are competent in doing this. And then finally, any cisgender patient could have trans or gender non-binary partners. And if we do not uh, really get that specific information, we wouldn't know it. So I would like you to, again, cross out in your brain with your red pen, uh, do you have sex with men, women, or both? This is still very commonly taught as the right way to uh, ask about sexual partners. And here's my beef with it. It does not tell us whether the partners in question are cisgender or transgender. A person could be asked, do you have sex with men, with men, women, or both? And say, I, let's say, let's say this is a, a cisgender woman. 
so somebody assigned female at birth identifies as a woman who is being asked this question and answers that my partners are women uh, and her partners are specifically transgender women. And then we are missing out if the provider assumes that those partners are cisgender women, not transgender women, then could miss out on some, a bunch of follow-up questions that need to be asked uh, for that person's health, for example, about contraception that they wouldn't know to ask otherwise. In the same vein, doesn't tell us if the partners in question are capable of pregnancy or of getting someone else pregnant. I think uh, many people have been you know, counseled on need for contraception when uh, there was no need for contraception. It is, uh, you know, like annoying for the person who is getting this talk about how they need to use birth control when they know that they are not going to get pregnant from the kind of sex they're having. Uh, but also like, you know, the like 15 to 20 minutes we have in primary care is precious. And like the idea that I would waste one minute of that counseling someone about something that is irrelevant for them is hurts my heart. Uh, it doesn't tell us what kind of sex somebody is having with those partners. So oral sex, anal sex, uh, vaginal sex, other things uh, are, is important to know to give people the kind of healthcare that they need. And then finally, this question assumes that everybody identifies as a man or woman. So it excludes non-binary identified people from the question entirely. So there's not a, there's not one question. There is not a easy roadmap that tells you exactly how to conduct a trans inclusive sexual health history, but there's a bunch of tools. So here are some questions that I use. I could say, I talk to all of my patients about sex to help them get the healthcare that they need. Tell me about the genders and bodies of your partners. I sometimes ask, do any of your partners have bodies that make sperm? And importantly, uh, it's important to ask, are there words that you would like me to use or to avoid when talking with you um, about your body parts or about sex? This is a table from Krampaski et al. Uh, 2020. And there's a couple tables in this paper, which I think you may find very helpful. This is a long list of alternatives uh, of less gendered language to commonly very gendered language that we use when talking about sexual health. This is another list of questions that can be used in taking a transgender inclusive sexual health history. Um, I saw go by in the chat, some people don't have sex. Absolutely. Um, so I would say that is definitely something to include. Uh, this is from a very new paper from last year, and this asked uh, transgender and this is TGE, transgender and gender expansive people uh, about words that they prefer to use for their own bodies. And this is a word cloud of words that people prefer um, instead of the word vagina for their bodies. Caveat, I will continue to use medical language throughout this presentation just so I'm as clear as possible so everyone knows what we're talking about, but it's not necessarily the language I'm gonna use when I speak with patients. This is an article from a couple years ago that I wrote. Um, Bedside of Providers is a really great resource if it's not something you're familiar with already. It is mainly a contraception, pregnancy uh, prevention focused website. Bedside of Providers is the provider side. There is also just Bedsider, which is a patient facing resource with really, really excellent contraception information. Okay, so back to the first question. Uh, assuming patients have opposite sex partners, no, we're not gonna assume everyone's heterosexual. Uh, we wanna ask open-ended questions. So really anything that says, 
this is what you do, right? Could be better rephrased to uh, let somebody answer openly. Again, we I went over my beef with, uh, do you have sex with men, women, or both? Met several issues with it, but importantly, excludes gender non-binary people from the equation at all, and also just doesn't get the information that you're looking for. And then something else, yes, we went over the something else. Next, we are going to go into talking a little bit more specifically about fertility and contraception needs for transgender and gender non-binary patients. Let's have a little example. Carmen, who uses they, them pronouns, is age 34, identifies as gender non-binary, and was assigned female at birth. They have taken masculinizing, gender-affirming hormone therapy. I think I failed to define my acronym anywhere. My apologies. For the past three years, masculinizing, gender-affirming hormone therapy, as an aside, uh, typically consists of various formulations of testosterone, occasionally other things, but mostly just testosterone. They had top surgery last year. They have not had any other gender-affirming surgeries. They are here today because they are considering trying to get pregnant and they are seeking preconception pre -conception counseling from you. So, which are true, this is a pick all that apply. They should be advised to discontinue testosterone prior to trying to conceive. Two, it is not possible for them to get pregnant while currently taking gender affirming hormone therapy. Three, because they have been on gender-affirming hormone therapy, it is not possible them for, to ever get pregnant, even if they stopped gender-affirming hormone therapy. And four, transgender and gender non-binary patients face additional barriers when trying to access assistive reproductive technology. I see lots of right answers passing by in the chat. All right, so to start off with, Transgender and gender non-binary patients may desire to make families in many different ways. People might desire to be pregnant. People might desire their partner to be pregnant. People might use their eggs or sperm in a surrogate or a partner. People might pursue foster, adoption, partnership, blended families, things I haven't listed here. It's really important to avoid making assumptions about people's parenting intentions. Either way, assuming that people want to parent, assuming that want people don't want to parent, we don't know unless we ask. This is, again, not a comprehensive list of barriers to family building for trans and gender non-binary people, but a few of them include lack of access to affirming healthcare services where people feel like they can go and get assistive reproductive technology services, um, even just, you know, basic preconception counseling that is competent in transgender health. The lack of insurance coverage for assistive reproductive technology is really significant. Uh, it's state to state and insurance to insurance, but assistive, reprodu assistive reproductive technology, ART, is very commonly not covered by health insurance and I think as many people have encountered is wildly expensive. Uh, there are many legal barriers to foster and adoption uh, for LGB people as well as transgender people. Um, and again, this is state to state. Financial barriers and cost generally, lack of family or social support, all of those things can get in the way of uh, efforts for trans and non-binary people to create the families that they desire. This is a comic that I really love. I cannot find the attribution. So if you ever run into the person who drew this, please tell me. Uh, the point of this is that we should not make assumptions about the uh, reproductive uh, capacities of folks. Uh, on the left, we have, I'm a lesbian trans woman. I'm a pansexual cis woman. We are a queer couple able to reproduce. In the middle, we have, I am a gay cis man. I am a bisexual trans man. We are a queer couple able to reproduce. 
On the right, we have, we are polysexual non-binary individuals, and they say, we are a queer couple able to reproduce. We're gonna talk a little bit more specifically now about gender affirming hormone therapy and fertility. Everybody starting gender affirming hormone therapy should receive counseling about what we currently know uh, about the effects of gender affirming hormone therapy on future fertility. I would say um, starting, but also continuing. So if I'm seeing somebody in my practice uh, for the first time, and they've been on gender affirming hormones already, I'm still going to review this information with them because I don't necessarily know what information they received when they started hormones originally. Uh, masculinizing gender affirming hormone therapy, which is primarily testosterone, it is really unknown to what degree fertility is reduced uh, when somebody is currently or previously on testosterone. However, pregnancy is definitely possible while somebody is even currently on gender affirming hormone therapy. I'm going to talk about that quite a bit over the next few slides. And many people have stopped gender affirming hormone therapy and then gotten pregnant, uh, sometimes with assistive reproductive technology, but many, many without. There really isn't any data that I'm aware of that. Uh, tries to estimate what the reduction of fertility, either while currently or previously on testosterone is. And for many reasons, it would be a challenging thing to try to study. Um, primarily, well, not primarily, partly, because testosterone is classified as a teratogen. A teratogen is any substance or medication that is known to harm a fetus. So, the, uh, the ethics of trying to study pregnancy and testosterone are complex, to say the least. Um, I usually put an asterisk on teratogen here um, to give some nuance to what, uh, what the specific effects of testosterone on a fetus are. I'm going to blow by that for the moment, but if somebody wants to hear about it at the end, let me know. Anybody planning to get pregnant should stop testosterone before trying to conceive. There is no specific data on how long of a quote unquote washout period would be required to get somebody's testosterone levels back to a safe level prior to try to conceive based on the half life of testosterone for intramuscular injected testosterone experts uh, suggest about two to four weeks at least different formulations of testosterone. Uh, will be different, and again, this is just an expert opinion. Four, feminizing gender-affirming hormone therapy. So that is typically compromised of some combination of estradiol and androgen blockers. Uh, this typically decreases sperm count and motility, but again, does not guarantee that somebody does not have any viable sperm. Sperm production may return to that person's baseline if they stopped feminizing gender affirming hormone therapy, but it may not. Um, we are unable to sort of make any guarantees that if somebody stopped their feminizing hormone therapy that their sperm reduction, their sperm production would return, but it is definitely possible. So knowing this uh, sort of <laughs> Black box, uh, not quite black box, like uh, indeterminate state of evidence about fertility and gender affirming hormones. Some people do choose to pursue fertility preservation prior to starting gender affirming hormone therapy, or sometimes stopping gender affirming hormone therapy if it has already been started to uh, do fertility preservation. And for people assigned female at birth, Fertility preservation typically comprises um, usually egg freezing, but can also be freezing of ovarian tissue um, or embryo preservation. I think, again, as many people have probably encountered, uh, fertility preservation is often not covered by insurance for uh, people assigned female at birth, so for egg freezing, embryo freezing, it can be wildly expensive. Um, 
I would say 10,000 is like on the lowest end of how much it can cost. And then typically there are ongoing fees for storage of uh, whatever gametes you're storing, or I guess for your egg or embryo storage. It's also pretty invasive. So getting, um, so egg retrieval typically involves many vaginal ultrasounds um, and then also taking hormones to for ovarian stimulation. For a trans or non-binary person, this could uh, be particularly distressing, this process. And so somebody who is considering that should really be uh, aware of what the process is going to be like before um, before going going to commit to it. Fertility preservation for people assigned male at birth is a little more straightforward. Typically, uh, we're just talking about semen or sperm preservation. Again, often not covered by health insurance, but the price point is significantly lower. Generally, we're talking about somewhere 300 to $500 plus some ongoing fees for storage. It could certainly be more than that in some circumstances, but that's probably the, the minimum. Samples are usually obtained through masturbation for some trans and gender non-binary people that might be uncomfortable, create dysphoria. Some, uh, some clinics may have other methods to obtain samples, but certainly less common. There are mail order companies like online internet companies that offer at-home semen preservation through the mail. Specifically how this works and like there must be some mailing of things on dry ice. I'm not familiar, but they're doing it. So I assume it works. Uh, and some of these are specifically marketed towards trans and non-binary people. So uh, the, if the idea of like going into a fertility clinic is really stressful for somebody, one of these mail order options might be a good fit. Let's get into contraception in a little bit more detail. I think we've talked about this quite a bit now, but we're gonna accurately evaluate pregnancy risk and intentions for all of our patients. Again, taking a comprehensive trans inclusive sexual health history is really essential to figuring out who is at risk for an unwanted or an unplanned pregnancy. You may fam be familiar with the organ inventory. I th think I put that on the next slide. Uh, and if I didn't, I'll circle back and explain it more. And then again, remember that sexuality is fluid and somebody's risk for pregnancy may change over time. So this isn't something you ask once in the very first visit and never ask again. It's important to check in with this over time, remind our patients that if um, their risk for pregnancy changes to make sure they let us know and why even if somebody is not currently at uh, risk for pregnancy based on their sexual activity, when I'm starting somebody on gender affirming hormones, I like make sure to like, I know you don't care about what I'm saying right now, but you might not feel like that forever. So just really listen, please. Okay, testosterone, again, is not a substitute for contraception. So if people, um, even if people are not getting a period, even if they are amenorrheic, it is still possible to get pregnant. They could still ovulate. Um, the physiology of that is explained a little bit in, again, this paper that is cited in the corner, if you are curious. There are, there, I'm sorry, excuse me, there are not uh, any contraceptive methods that are specifically contraindicated because someone is on gender affirming hormone therapy. So somebody, it is okay for somebody to be on an estrogen and or progesterone containing contraceptive method in addition to uh, testosterone. That's okay. It is not going to diminish the efficacy of either. And uh, the, aside from, let's say, like bleeding changes specifically, there aren't going to be feminizing effects of being on uh, an estrogen or a progesterone containing method. However, 
Some people might not want to be on an estrogen or a progesterone containing method because it just doesn't feel right to, to their gender identity. And that's okay. We can talk about non hormonal methods. The considerations for what contraceptive method is going to be a good fit for a trans and non binary person is going to be unique for uh, trans and non binary people compared to cisgender people. So, uh, for example, let's just go into privacy, which is here a little bit. Somebody, let's say a trans person who lives with a roommate uh, that they are not out to as transgender takes birth control pills. For a cisgender person, somebody finding their birth control pills means that that person now knows they take birth control, maybe means that that other the person who finds their birth control pills thinks that that means that that person's sexually active. But for a trans person, it could mean that they are being outed as trans uh, by somebody finding their birth control pills. So the importance of privacy may take on some different aspects. Let's come back to Carmen. Uh, I put the info that uh, was in the uh, original slide here. So, which are true? I think everybody that I saw in the chat was correct. So, yes, people should be advised to discontinue testosterone prior to trying to conceive because testosterone is a teratogen. It is possible for someone to get pregnant while taking testosterone. Testosterone use does not guarantee infertility, either current concurrent with the testosterone or after if someone had discontinued testosterone. And yes, absolutely, trans and non-binary people do face additional barriers to accessing assistive reproductive technology. I want to go back for a moment. I failed to include a slide about contraception for trans and non-binary people assigned male at birth. Condoms. Uh, if someone, if a person assigned male at birth is sexually active with someone who is, has the capacity to get pregnant and having a kind of sex that could get them pregnant, then those two people should use condoms for vaginal intercourse and or the partner should be on uh, some kind of contraceptive method. We are going to talk for a few minutes about cervical cancer screening, and then we will have plenty of time for questions at the end. If you have it, check it. Let's come back to Carmen. So Carmen is back to see you for their annual wellness visit. Um, oh, excuse my typo. Um, I summarized their history from the previous question. They're unsure if they've ever had a pop test or cervical cancer screening. They report that they've had one cisgender female partner for the past six years. They are very anxious when you bring up cervical cancer screening. Which of the following things are true? Pick all that apply. One, they do not need a pap test because they are not sexually active with any partners who are assigned male at birth. Two, they should have been required to do a pap test prior to starting gender affirming hormone therapy. Three, they should temporarily discontinue testosterone in order to complete their pap test. And four, a self administered swab for primary HPV screening could be considered as an alternative to cytology and HPV co testing. We'll give you all a few minutes. Those answers are a little bit more dense. All right, cervical cancer screening. The recommendations for cervical cancer screening for trans and non-binary people assigned female at birth are the same as the guidelines for cisgender women. Transgender patients, as well as LGB women, cisgender women, generally um, have much lower rates of cervical cancer screening compared to heterosexual cisgender women. If somebody has had a total hysterectomy, so a hysterectomy that includes the removal of the cervix for gender affirmation, then they do not need cervical cancer screening. So coming back to the organ inventory 
uh, which I did not put a slide on. So let me talk about that a little bit. Um, organ inventory is a section in many electronic medical records. Typically, it's like put under where we ask people about their pronouns and sex assigned at birth to try to keep track of what organs someone does and doesn't have that are, you know, specifically gendered organs. So breasts, prostates, penises, testicles, ovaries, uterus, vagina, cervix. I might have missed one. Uh, and like a little, you know, like an epic plus minus buttons to keep track of what organs that person has so that specifically in this circumstance, we can keep track of whether this is a person who needs cervical cancer screening. Oh, and I put in specifically total hysterectomy for gender affirmation. If someone has had a total hysterectomy for a different indication like cancer, then that person should be in touch with their oncologist about what their future needs for cancer screening are. We want to definitely remember our trauma-informed care principles when conducting PAP testing for trans and non-binary patients. Uh, not going to go into a great detail about this now because this could absolutely be its own lecture, but uh, trauma-informed care principles um, presume that we treat uh, everyone as though this experience of doing the PAP could be, has a potential for being a traumatic experience that many, many people have uh, trauma histories and that we want to do everything we can to make receiving healthcare not traumatic. So some easy things include making sure you're getting consent for absolutely everything you're doing, explaining what you're doing while you're doing it, letting people have support people in the room, letting people listen to music or play on their phones while you're doing this if they don't want to pay attention. Uh, but again, trauma informed care can go into Great detail. So look out for those resources if you want them. And then finally, we definitely can consider HPV only testing or primary HPV screening for people assigned female at birth who can't tolerate a pap test or cytology. Uh, HPV, primary HPV screening is when we just do the HPV test first as opposed to cytology and or cytology and HPV. And then the uh, screening algorithm goes from the HPV result only. Currently, the FDA is, has only approved a provider collected HPV sample. However, many countries, including uh, Netherlands and Australia, have self collected HPV, primary HPV screening. Uh, protocols and I expect that we will see them here sometime. And so I would say sort of on a harm reduction framework, if somebody is like over my dead body, am I doing a pap test? Um, then I would much rather that that person do a self-collected HPV swab than nothing at all. Here are some great uh, PSAs from Rainbow Health Ontario encouraging uh, trans and gender non-binary folks to get PAP screening, PAP tests. And let's come back to Carmen. So, uh, which of these things are true? Um, so, number one, no, uh, cervical cancer screening guidelines um, are not based on who you have sex with or even whether you're sexually active. Two, uh, they should be required to complete a PAP test. No, this is something that does uh, that I have heard of, and it hurts my heart. Um, cervical cancer screening is not a requirement to start for starting a gender affirming hormone therapy. Certainly, we want to encourage people to do all of their healthcare maintenance, their preventative healthcare screenings, um, but we're not going to use it as a, a bar to jump over a gate to keep people from the affirming the gender affirming care that they need. Um, additionally. 
many people, once they are started um, on gender affirming hormones um, or engaged with a provider who is competent in trans health and is demonstrating that competence with their care, are probably going to be more likely to be able to engage in, for example, cervical cancer screening, but also um, other like other healthcare um, for whatever kind of healthcare they need. And so saying that the other things have to come first is actually quite counterproductive. Um, we no, you don't need to stop gender affirming hormone therapy to do cervical cancer screening. And then finally, yes, primary HPV screening is an acceptable alternative and the self swab is not yet FDA approved, but is certainly used in other countries. So, I think I have left us in even 10 minutes for questions. This is my email address, milha at ucdavis.edu. Please reach out. I am excited to hear from you and excited to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Miles. That was such a great presentation. And it looks like we have questions coming in in the chat. Um, so I will read those out and then Miles can answer. So the first question is primary HPV screening can be done without doing a pap smear? Um, so the, um, so pap smear typically is referring to the cytology um, where we're looking at the cells on the cervix depending so the sort of the consensus guidelines uh, currently, you st start with cytology and then depending on the result of the cytology and or that person's age, you either reflex to HPV or you co-test with HPV. The difference between that and primary HPV screening is that we're not doing the cytology, we're starting just with the HPV test only and then somebody, depending on the results of that HPV test, may then need cytology um, or colposcopy, depending on the HPV results. Okay, and our next question is, do you recommend providers to offer topical estrogen for people on testosterone to minimize discomfort during a pap smear slash pelvic exam? What a great question. Um, so I'll give a little bit of background info here. Uh, testosterone can cause atrophic changes for people assigned female at for people assigned female at birth, uh, similar to menopausal changes. So any decrease to the estrogen to vulvovaginal tissues um, can make tissues more fragile, feel irritated, itchy, uncomfortable. Some people feel like they have a UTI all the time. So I offer everyone uh, different preparations of vaginal estrogen or estradiol generally, but especially before a pap test uh, or any kind of pelvic exam, I also, again, offer to uh, prescribe a vaginal estradiol. It can come in a couple different forms. I would say the cream is good, especially for people who feel like the, their symptoms are mainly external, but it can also be used internally. It kind of just looks like uh, over-the-counter yeast infection treatment at the like tube in the plunger. It can also come as a vaginal suppository, which is a little tiny tab on the end of a little applicator. And there is also an estradiol containing ring. It looks kind of like a Nuva ring, except it's just the estradiol and, excuse me, um, you just leave it in. The other benefit of using an estradiol before uh, cytology or pap testing is that the cells on the cervix sometimes from, again, these atrophic changes uh, cause more unsatisfactory pap results than someone not taking testosterone. And it really sucks to like talk someone, not talk someone into, um, have someone who is reluctant uh, do a pap and then get unsatisfactory results and either like talk about repeating it or what we do now. And so using some vaginal estradiol pre-procedure can reduce the risk for that. 
Great. Thank you. Um, so we have time for maybe one more question. I'll see if that comes in. Emily, if you can go ahead and put a link to our evaluation survey and CE credits in the chat. Um, we'll see if anyone has a final question. And just so everyone here knows, we will also send out a link to recordings and slides to everyone who registered in a few weeks. Um, oh, I see one about uh, IUD placement. Oh, um, I missed that. <laughs> um, so the, I think it's probably less about the cervical tissue, but cervical plus vulvovaginal tissues can certainly, um, make the process of IUD insertion less comfortable. So I think pre-procedure estradiol for that, um, may also be beneficial, but in the Krampaski et al. paper, paper, there's actually quite a bit about IUD placement for trans and non-binary folks. So you could get some more info there. Okay. And we have a question that I think is important to, and we still have a little time. How do we make it mandatory for medical staff to get this training? Um, I would take that up with your organization, but then send me an email and I am happy to help you out. Okay, we have time for maybe one more question. I'm not good at gauging time, so my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, uh, what is the access code for the survey? Emily, do you, can you put that in the chat? Oh, and someone said there are questions further up. I'm so sorry, Christina. Uh -uh. Miles, feel free to scroll up and if you see a question I missed. Uh, oh, okay, here's one from Jacqueline. What sort of fallout are we expecting from the latest Texas laws regarding children and gender affirming treatment? Uh, that is a great question. And for my own sanity, I am pretty checked out of that story. Um, but I could find some resources and send out a link after. Okay. And we also have a question. I have heard that estrogen containing contraceptives could stimulate chest growth, even in people who have top surgery. Is this true? Not a contraindication, obviously, but I would love to, I, I have included in my counseling. Would love to mm -hmm. hear your thoughts. So I would, I would definitely say can cause tenderness. Um, whether there's actual uh, a change in size, um, I am not as sure about, but I would certainly include um, somebody who's starting on an estrogen containing method that they might experience some tenderness. That is typically self-limited, meaning that it's going to go away on its own after the first month month or two um, and not be something they would experience the whole time they're on an estrogen containing contraceptive, um, but certainly something to take into account when picking a method. If that would be particularly distressing for someone, then it's not a good fit. And in the, again, in the Krampaski et al article, there's a really big chart that has every contraceptive method and every, uh, like, contraceptive side effects that we could think of in like a big grid. And so you can like, you know, show someone or discuss with someone like the worst thing that could happen would be, for example, chest tenderness. And so you can go down that row and be like, okay, we're definitely not doing these. Maybe this one's a good fit. All right. Um, it looks like we are out of time now. So I just want to say thank you again, Miles. Thank you also to all the audience members who were very participatory in this. And yeah, I forgot to mention I live in Sacramento, which is how I know Miles. And it's so wonderful having you in our healthcare community. And thank you so much for sharing this information with our wider NNLM audience. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me.